Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. I've got a really fantastic guest for you today, Deanna Moffitt, and she's an accomplished speaker. She's coach and she's author of Be Rewrite, Change Your Life One Story at a Time. I love having entrepreneurs such as Deanna on my show to showcase their brand, their services, and have an all around inspiring conversation. So Deanna, welcome. Well, thanks, Christopher. I'm really happy to be here. I see you on TikTok all over the place, so I'm <laughs> glad to be here. Yeah, I love, uh, yeah, TikTok is kind of the uh, pound square now these days, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and happy to have you on the show. Tell people your story, and we'll dive right into it. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. I love it. I'm happy to. Where yeah. oh you want me where you want me to start? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my story is a lot about uh so let me take you back to where I was. Um, you know, I I grew up in a pretty traditional home, dysfunctional as all get out. Um, alcoholic father, raging mother, uh son that went into um the jail system <laughs> at a young age. And I just kind of watched all this happening. Uh-huh. And uh, my part of my escape was actually reading a lot of books. And I just fell in love with the stories. And that took me kind of into my career. You know, there wasn't a lot of big dreaming in my life. A lot of it was around survival. So I went from school right into work and um, didn't go to college until I went into a career where they basically please, Deanna, go get your degree. We'll pay for it. And I was like, I was a high, high head performer, but they really wanted the, the degree behind my name. Happy to do it. Went and went and did it. And then I took an improv class. Um, I was about 32 or 33 at the time. And I fell in love. And at the time I was a senior IT project manager and I was working on mergers and acquisitions within the company that I was working for. But I thought, oh my gosh, this thing that I get to do on the weekend feels like I just get to play like a little kid. And um, I loved it so much that I started touring with um, my partner and I. We had a show called All Jane, No Dick. And it was just two women <laughs> who turned around doing improv comedy, did comedy festivals all over the place. And I started thinking, what would happen if I just did this? So at the tender age of 36, I left my very secure a job and I moved to Chicago and I started performing improv comedy in all of the major theaters and really had a great time. I, um, I worked on cruise ships for about 18 months of my life. I can tell you everything that happens below the deck on a cruise ship. And um, also I, along the way, I, I took a class on storytelling and how do you tell effective stories? And I loved it. And I can remember the first time that I was going to do a show and there might've been six people in the audience, Chris. I almost had a panic attack on the side. Now, listen, I had been doing uh -huh. improv for years where I could go in front of literally a thousand people and make it up on the spot. But having a piece of paper in my hand and telling my personal story was about to send me down <laughs> anxiety row. So I remember taking a big deep breath, stepping down in front of all six people in a coffee shop. And I'm in pure panic for the first maybe 10 seconds. And then I got my first laugh. And I was like, ah, okay. And I can do it. But I'm sure that paper still shook the entire time. And I thought it was so fascinating. Um, and then I I dove deep into storytelling. What are the components of it? And I started teaching storytelling for the famed Second City Theater in Chicago. And I hosted and created two really popular storytelling shows. And I got fascinated by the way we tell our stories and that we're often portraying ourselves as the victim or the hero in our stories. And um, then when I left Chicago and I moved out to LA, I went on one audition. I actually got to a call back, but realized, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this. It felt like I didn't have any control of my career and I, I wanted some more stability. So I had been doing um, facilitation using improv in companies and showing how what we do on stage is directly applicable to leaders and, and creation. And, you know, you really have to value people's ideas. You really have to say yes. And to a lot of, a lot of things you really have to stay in the moment and listen when you're on stage. And all those things are critical um, to leaders, but really to humanity, to be honest with you. 
And so I used those facilitation skills to kind of divert into leadership development and started working for some big companies, um, talking about different aspects of leadership. And then I started, I remember um, there's a gentleman named John Kim, who's an dubbed the angry therapist. <laughs> and uh, he and I went to the same CrossFit box for a while. And he was teaching these classes called mindset classes for the athletes. And at one time he mentioned, oh, and I have a coaching school. And I was like, what the hell is a coaching school? I didn't know what coaching was. And, um, but because I'd been in leadership development now for a few years, I thought, well, I'll, I'll pony up. I'll go to this coaching school. And I, I loved it. And I actually started teaching for that coaching school and I teach a whole class on questioning and I, um, how do we really get curious, not only with other people, but I think it's powerful to be cognizant of the kind of questions we're asking ourselves, right? So once I started coaching, I realized there is a merging of all my time in storytelling, you know, when performative storytelling, that every client that was coming to me was just telling me a story. They were telling me a story of all the things they couldn't do or the reasons why they couldn't do it. And I got really fascinated by that. And so then I dove deep into, you know, narrative storytelling or narrative therapy and, and really looking at help, helping people take a look at their old past core wounded stories, but also the stories they tell in the moment and the stories that they tell about their future. And oftentimes we don't even create a story for our future. And so without a story of our future, we have no, no direction on where we want to go. Yeah. So that's a lot, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's uh yeah, it's interesting cuz uh you know, you know, I also found solace in books too. It's kind of like entering this new world and um just kind of ideas and you're you mm -hmm. can escape from the chaos and you know all the dysfunction that you that you were describing. And um yeah, so we'll we'll you know, we'll dive right into it. So um you know, kind of thing is um inspiration behind the rewrite and share with us what specifically inspired you to write it and then um, mm. you know, well, a pivotal moment in your career that sparked the idea um, you know tell us more yeah. yeah I remember one of the books I grabbed off my mom's book stand at some point was when I and this is when I was much younger was Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking and it was the first book that I opened that I was like oh you know this mind thing this this idea of giving more direction to my life as opposed to life just happening to me was at an early age allowed me to kind of think about my life differently. So I didn't dive deep into personal development straight from that book, but I, I remember that book being a catalyst, but I also remember I will, I didn't grow up in a religious family. So I, I felt like I had to navigate around all of the religion behind it or that God focused in it. And not that I, really support where people are at, but I just didn't have that at the time. And so my catalyst for writing the rewrite is really kind of a primer in the same vein of, I'd love it to reach people who maybe are new to the idea of personal development, um, who are like, I'm feeling stuck. I don't think this is the way I want my life to go. I don't know what else to do. And throughout the book, because I'm a coach, I just provide some questions. So it's not only a book, but a little bit of a journal prompting exercise as well for people to think about, oh, here's a great question. Again, the power of our questions, you know, the questions we ask ourselves really are the lens with which we experience our world. And so if I can help people ask some better questions, they usually can have a better outcome. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I love this um, idea because what you're describing is kind of like what Tony Robbins is describing, like kind of changing the narrative, you know, mm -hmm. questioning your beliefs and, you know, rewriting mm -hmm. the stories. Um, so, you know, in your book, you talk about different kinds of stories we tell ourselves yeah. and elaborate on these types and how they shape our perception of ourselves and the world around us. Yeah. So I do break it down into three different kinds of stories. So we have our, what I would call the core wounded stories. And these are the stories that we don't often even realize that we have, but they're the stories of like, I'm not enough, or I'm yeah. a burden, or I'm not lovable. And while we might not articulate those stories, we are definitely living those stories out. Our behaviors, right, are based on these subconscious stories we have. You know, through my work, I realized, oh, I have a story of I'm a burden. 
And I think that came from my earliest Genesis, Christopher, because I was adopted, you know, so I, I was not, my birth mother was not my parent. You know, I can imagine that there was some energy energetic in my DNA or my being, even at the young age. And then I just imagine, you know, I wasn't adopted for six weeks. So I was in a child services care home for that time. And my mom told me that when she got me, my eyes were matted shut. My tear ducts weren't open. Um, and I was like, oh, well, what kind of care was I getting for those six <laughs> weeks, right? <laughs> and so, you know, when I was really able to look at that story and see what kind of BS that was, <laughs> but how that was playing out, you know, when you're a burden, you try to people please, you, you're trying to convince everybody you're not a burden. So you don't ask for things, you don't ask for help. Um, and that I've seen that play out in my life over and over and over again. Um, and so rewriting that story, and it's a hard rewrite, to be honest with you, to I'm a blessing. Like the idea of how do you walk around the earth differently from I'm a burden to I'm a blessing. Even when I say it, I just feel lighter and I feel easier, right? And so that is in my background, just constantly kind of being erased and rewritten, being erased and rewritten. And much as, um, so that's the core wounded stories. The present day stories are the stories that hook us emotionally. You know, these are the stories that I often talk about. Like when we're in traffic is the first one that comes to my mind. When I was, I lived in Portland, Oregon and Christopher, when <laughs> people see someone in a crosswalk 20 feet away, they stop and they, you know, they wait for the person to get to the corner and then cross completely. Like at the time that I grew up there, no one was honking their horn. It was such a genteel area. It might've changed over the years, but I moved from Portland to Chicago and Chicago at that time, you know, they, they didn't have Lyft or Ubers. They just had street fills of taxi people who I considered terribly rude drivers cutting me <laughs> off. Blah, blah, blah. And within literally 10 days of being in Chicago, my head was spinning in the car. Every expletive that could come out of my mouth was coming out of my mouth. I thought everyone was a jerk and I was suffering during the drives. And those are present day stories. Those things that we react to emotionally and the story that we tell ourselves is that guy's a jerk. I can't believe that idiot did that. Right. So, you know, coming to realize, oh, I'm the only one suffering in this. And what's a better story I can tell? Maybe yeah. they're like, they got, you know, they got to get to the hospital. So even just changing those stories to allow me not to get emotionally hooked. And then the third story is our future stories. And oftentimes people create kind of at a safety net, these, um, these stories of Stephen King level <laughs> horrificness that can happen in the future. And sure, terrible things can happen. But I also think that if we can have a future story or a future relationship with our future self, Mm. That can pull us into a future that we might not have ever imagined. I'm sure, Christopher, looking at you and what you're doing in your life, if you had asked yourself five years ago, would you have a podcast? Look, looking, knowing that where you've been and what you've been doing, right? But there was a reason. There was something that came up for you mm. that said, I think I want to try this. I want to do this. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, because I've I've always wanted to interview um you know, successful people and just kind of had to have a place where people come and, you know, either make comments or watch or share, listen, you know, kind of, that's kind of what I, and then, um, and then, uh, you know, with Zoom now, first it was like blogs, but now you got Zoom and now you can create a video and put it on YouTube, you know, you can have your mm -hmm. own, you can put it on Spotify, Apple, um, just the amount of just ways you can share information is, is just exploded. Um, yeah. The uh, it reminds me because one I just got back from New York City and it's really interesting. Like um, in that place, you can actually just make yourself get triggered and then actually rewrite mm -hmm. your story because there's just so much chaos going that yeah. it forces you to rewrite your your brain and kind of be like, oh, he's in a hurry or oh, she had a bad day and all this stuff. And then it just kind of teaches you not to take things personally. Um, so that's that's always love to do. Just put yourself <laughs> yeah. in some like chaos. In. <laughs> yeah, you have to look at like when those moments, because you know, especially if you're a parent or you're in a in you're employed, you're in a workplace that can feel toxic, that we can often just get immersed in that and allowing, you know, other people's experiences affect us. I used to call it, you know, when I had someone when I worked in the workplace. 
and people get angry or, or upset. It's like, oh, they're wearing a garbage suit and they, they can't, they don't like the garbage suit. doesn't feel good on them. And they want to take the garbage suit off and put it on me. But their garbage suit never fits on me. So I'm going to let them keep their garbage suit and I'm going to stay over here, <laughs> not wearing what they're trying to give me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, the next thing you talk about is, um, you know, talk about this, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but Qigong and mm -hmm. storytelling and yeah. you're studying to become a uh, Qigong instructor. And how do you find that this practice intersects with the concept mm -hmm. of rewriting one story and synergy between mental and physical and kind of mm -hmm. the process of personal narrative transformation? I love that. Thanks for asking <laughs> that. It is Qigong. You got it perfectly right. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, it's an ancient Chinese practice. So it's like the grandfather of Tai Chi. No. Um, it, qi means just energy and gong means work. So we're working with the energy, the energy body. And, you know, what I'm realizing more and more is that it's really almost impossible to completely rewrite your story from the top down, from the mental, from the mind to the body. Um, because the stories are trapped in our bodies, right? We can we can have moments, we can smell a smell, we can hear something that immediately takes us back to an experience, right? That uh -huh. if we haven't processed that trauma, it's still in our body. We'll immediately feel the shortness of breath. We'll immediately feel maybe afraid and scared. And so when I, with Qigong, which is an energy work, and it's almost like a moving meditation, what, what the foundation of it is, is releasing stress, releasing energy, transforming energy. And so for me, it's a practice of, you know, thinking about what it is I want to create, who is it that I want to be and being in that space, but also allowing any of the old energy around traumas or any of the old energy around stories to kind of come up and be transformed. I found that also doing Qigong or, or breath work, transformative breath work can be really helpful or EMDR therapy, anything that can actually get your body engaged in processing old traumas or old stories can really help us um, move that through our bodies. Mm. Yeah, which is quite interesting because um, there's a really interesting book, The the um, the Body Keeps a Score, talking about mm -hmm. where you store and hold trauma and kind of yes. what is this process of releasing trauma look like feel like um how do you do it, it it's mm. always fascinating yeah well i can tell you some of my most transformative experiences have been in deep breath work like mm. really oxygenating your body and doing um you know there's a there's a process called toning where you're actually kind of really expelling through voice and through your body energy uh -huh. Um, but energy is in us, right? It's, it's, we are made of energy and we, so that's part of it is, you know, the deep transformative work of breath work, but also in Qigong is the understanding that our energy can get stuck. And so that's why we're moving all of our joints all the time. We're moving, um, this energy body, you know, when people are in a work a position where they're just sitting for most of the day or they aren't moving their body that their energy really does get stuck mm. and you can see how they we age much quicker when we're not moving our bodies when we're not mobile and um those processes those traumas that we've had from years ago can get stuck in your you know your lower back is a great place for it your upper back maybe even up here and Injuries can manifest themselves or illnesses can manifest themselves when we allow that stuck negative energy to stay in our bodies. Mm, yeah, I love that. How can people contact you, follow your resources, check out your book, et cetera? Yeah, you can come to my website. Uh, yeah. I got a lot of double letters in my name. So it's D-E-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. I should probably have that here on the bottom here. D-E-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A, and the last name is M-O-F-F-I-T-T. -T. Just go to my website, <laughs> DeannaMoffitt.com and you can find out more. My book is on Amazon. It's called The Rewrite, Change Your Life One Story at a Time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'd love for the people to come in and join that. Yeah. And for all the audience out there, let's thank uh, Deanna for coming on and um sharing her insights and wisdoms. Be sure to check out her book on Amazon and um, as well as follow her on social media. And with that, thanks so much for coming onto the podcast.
Thanks, Christopher. Thanks for having me, my friend.